Hello, this is Kenneth Lee, Professor of Asian Religions at Cal State Northridge. And this is my talk on Buddhism and the environment, mindfully loving nature. People who are concerned about the protection of the environment have found inspiration within the Buddhist tradition. The concern for the welfare of nature has always been important practice in Buddhism. Although Buddhists believe that human beings or sentient beings, feeling oriented, have a unique opportunity to realize enlightenment, they have never considered or asserted themselves superior to nature. The Buddhist teachings of mindfulness and dependent origination assert that humans in nature or sentient beings and non-sentient beings um, are interdependent, which implies that we need to take care of each other for mutual benefit. Otherwise, our neglect and exploitation of nature will lead to mutual suffering. Now the Buddha had compassion for nature even before his enlightenment. During his six years of practicing severe austerities as an ascetic, he said to have developed compassion even for a drop of water and was determined not to de destroy even a minute creature. Additionally, the Buddha had a profound appreciation of the beautiful surrounding. In the discourse on the noble quest, Buddha describes his renunciation, striving, and his enlightenment and freedom, his search for a suitable place for his strivings. He saw a delightful piece of land, a soothing forest grove, a river flowing besides with clear water and fords, and a village close by where he could collect alms. The Buddha expressed great respect and gratefulness for the environment. Immediately after attaining enlightenment, Buddha remained standing before the seat where he sat and the tree that provided him with shade, gazing at them for one week without blinking his eye. Now the word mindfulness in Sanskrit, Sanskrit is called sati, draws upon um, one of the samadhi or deep meditative categories in the Eightfold Path, along with concentration and right effort. When Buddha realized enlightenment, he was sitting under a peepal tree, now called a Bodhi tree, and surrounded by nature, even calling witness to Mother Nature to overcome the temptations of Mara, the god of the underworld. When Buddha was in meditation, he was mindful of the interconnected relationship between sentient beings and non-sentient beings. Consequently, the Sanskrit word for mindfulness, sati, um, which is also uh, translated as truth in the Buddhist context as relative truth. This mindfulness is an awareness of things in relation to things. So when, again, Buddha realized enlightenment, it was while well, in, the, in the context of nature and the interconnected and, uh, relationship that he and everything around him um, and the vegetation, tree, everything, was interconnected. That was his profound realization and enlightenment. Mindfulness uh, views all sentient and non-sentient beings as equal in Buddha, in Buddha nature, so that there is no hierarchical relationship between the two, but rather a harmonious, happy, and mutually beneficial relationship exists. Where there is an equilibrium, and mutually dependent relationship. All involved parties seek to promote the welfare of each other. In, in one sense, um, the Buddhists teach um, that we, are, we have all been our mothers in the past. So when we look at each other, there's really you know, a, a gratif, gratitude and love for everybody. Gary Snyder, uh, the Zen poet and eco-philosopher says that the bioregional commu community, quote, does not end at the human boundaries. We are in a community with certain trees, plants, birds, and animals. And Snyder encourages others to take up this practice of uh, re-inhabituation. Oh, I'm sorry, re-inhabitation, re-inhabitation, uh, which means to learn to live on a land with same respect and understanding as the original indigenous people. Um, basically, our world is the Sangha, and in the Sangha, 
which means the Buddhist community, everybody's equal. But this equality is, you know, extended to nature as well and animals, of course. Now, as I continue my talk, um, you can look at my slides and I'll go next slide, next slide. So this is the second slide, um, which where it shows the gulch, uh, the green gulch center that I'll talk about right now. So today in USA, especially Northern California, there's a lot of uh, uh, eco move, ecological movements practicing this interdependent relationship between humans and nature. For instance, there's a B Buddhist Peaceful Fellowship in, called BPF, which is an international network or, uh, originated in Hawaii and, and now it's headquartered in Oakland, California. They've been active since uh, 1978. Uh, they promote equal living and sustainable communities. And as you see on the slide, also in California, in Muir Beach is the Green Gulch Farm Zen Center. Every day, the people who reside there say a Zen meal chant before eating. They're thankful for the labor it took to get the food, moving irrigation pipes, uh, cropping salad greens, propagating uh, greenhouse seedlings, turning composts, and etc. They also have annual tree planting, waste recycling, and educating neighbors about organic farming. The Green Gulch also did away with cattle grazing and herbicides. There are others in Northern California, such as the Spirit Rock Meditation Center in San uh, Geronimo Valley. And there's one that's close to CSUN, uh, Yokoji Zen Mountain Center in Apple Canyon near Lake Hemet, just towards Ojai. So by their exemplary living, practice and outreach, these beacons of light call for all people and communities to be mindfully, to mindfully love nature. Now I'm gonna look at some excerpts from the Pali Canon, which is like the Buddhist Bible, um, starting from the Buddha and up to the masters and you know, their attitudes towards nature. Like the Green Gulch Center, the Buddha respected cattle in favor of carrying out sacrifices he approved of. This is the next slide. Um, he says, in this sacrifice, Brahmins, uh, no bulls were slain. Brahmin is, it means priest. In this sacrifice, Brahmin, no bulls were slain, no goats or sheep, no cocks or pigs, no were various living beings subject to slaughter, no were trees cut down for sacrificial posts, no were grasses mown for the sacrificial grass. And those who are called slaves or servants or workmen do not perform their task for fear of blows or threats, weeping and in tears. But those who wanted to do something did it, and those who did not wish to did not. Uh, they did what they wanted to do and not what they did not want to do. The sacrifice was carried out with ghee, butter, curds, honey, and molasses. Consequently, uh, Buddha also gave uh, rules forbidding people to pollute lakes and rivers, as well as keeping saliva, urine, and feces away from green grass. So don't pee on the grass. Okay, uh, next slide. This is the story of Moggallana, one of his closest disciples. On one occasion, the Buddha had an exchange with one of his closest disciples, the monk Moggallana, when the monk's custom of receiving daily food from the local people as charity was undermined by a famine. Okay, Venerable Moggallana went to the Blessed One. He said, Lord, alms food is hard to get in Varanya now. There is a famine and food tickets have been issued. It is not easy to survive even by strenuous gleaning. Lord, this earth's under surface is rich and as sweet as pure honey. It would be good if I turn the earth over. Then the bhikkhus, or the monks, will be able to eat the hummus that the water plants live on. But Moggallana, what will become of the creatures that depend on the earth's surface? Lord, I shall make one hand as broad as the great earth and get the creatures that depend on earth's surface to go on to it. I shall turn 
the earth over with the other hand. Enough, Mogalana. Do not suggest turning the earth over. Creatures will be confounded. So you can see uh, Buddha's concern there uh, for the little creatures. Uh, next slide. The natural environment uninhabited by humanity was also a, a place, an ideal place for cultivating spiritual insights. This 8th century India, Indian poet and venerable uh, Shanti Deva expressed his love of being in nature. He says, when shall I come to dwell in forests amongst the deer, the birds and the trees that say nothing unpleasant and are delightful to associate with? Next slide, Milarepa, the Tibet's uh, great 11th century yogi saint, also praised the benefits of living alone in the wild. This is a delightful place, a place of hills and forests. In the mountain meadows, flowers bloom. In the woods dance the swaying trees. For monkeys, it is a playground. Birds sing tunefully, bees fly and buzz. And from day until night, the rainbows come and go. In summer and winter falls the sweet rain. And mists and fog roll up in the fall and spring. And at such a pleasant place, is solitude. I, Milarepa, happily abide, mediti meditating upon the void, illuminating mind. And uh, next slide. And finally, um, the 13th century uh, Zen master Dogen, he's the founder of uh, Soto Zen Buddhism, uh, expressed profound teachings of Buddhism like a haiku poetry. Here's the first one, and we'll look at these uh, together closely. He says, water being dependent on water is liberated. The second one, there is no separation between the sage and the mountain. If you look at this, um, uh, these poetry, now Dogen, the founder um, of uh, Soto Zen Buddhism, he really loved nature because he actually built his temple, his like headquarter temple and monastery in deep uh, part of nature, a uh, place called uh, um, Aheji. Um, it's deep in the mountains, uh, it amidst pristine forest of changing colors of leaves. You can see on the, on the next slide, slide um, nestled between uh, crags amidst running streams in Fukui. Fukui is about a two and a half uh, train ride north of Kyoto. So look at the, uh, the first uh, stanza about the water. Once again, water being dependent on water is liberated. So here's that de in, uh, dependent relationship uh, theme coming out there. So water, there are many types of water, but no original water, no water of various types, but the various waters which accord with the kind of beings that see water, do not depend on mind, they don't depend on the body, they don't arise from karma and are not self-reliant and are not reliant upon others. So once again, water being dependent on water is liberated. For example, uh, there's, there are endless ways of perceiving water, right? Uh, like rain can be a blessing for farmers, uh, rain can be a nuisance or danger for people who live below the mudslides or rain for a kayaker uh, who might be, they might be excited, he might be excited uh, about the high and fast rapids. But rain could also be a danger for uh, people who live among the river banks. So depends how we perceive water, depends on who we are, and also depends on the time and place as well as our relationship with water. Hence, water is liberated because it is empty. Empty is a, another a very important uh, teaching in Buddhism. It's called shunyata. It's not being empty or nothing. It's just empty of any independent existence. But empty is in between uh, nothing and absolute something. It's in a, a, the middle way of existence, um, conventional existence, as they say in, in Buddhism, but it is empty of any um, uh, uh, 
permanent uh, substance. Okay, shunyata, it's a, it's a very uh, key teaching in Buddhism. So that's how water is liberated of any fixed characteristics. So although there are many ways of seeing water, for the individual who's seen it, there is only that one way and nothing else exists at that moment. Okay, I, I hope that was clear. But in the second stanza, let's look at it. Uh, there is no separation between the sage and the mountain. So here we go. Uh, in the second stanza, you know, the sages are the wise people. They typically enter mountains to um, fast, uh, do a pilgrim pilgrimage or a retreat, and to build temples. But, but Dogen says that no one has ever met a single one of them because these sages entered a realm that is free from dualities, uh, being and non-being. And this is the realm of emptiness, that kind of in-betweenness, um, free from all dualities arising from their um, misknowledge or their ignorance uh, of a distinct and separate self, which is the Atman, which Buddhism does not teach. They teach, uh, I say non-self, because... Uh, not self or no self seems a little bit nihilistic, but Buddhism teaches that the self exists, but only in a conventional way, because the self can be broken down into many uh, components, or they call it aggregates. Uh, the five aggregates being uh, form or the body, and uh, and then we have uh, sensations, and uh, we have um, um, perceptions. And cessations are the five sensations along with the mind and the perceptions that uh, correspond with that and the mental formations when we have these kind of identifying behavior and then consciousness. Look about, uh, yeah, read about the five aggregates and that's why Buddhism teaches the, the non-self or anatman uh, and in Pali is called anatta. So getting back to the stanza, so when Dogen speaks of the sage, sage entering the mountains, he's speaking of the non-dual dharma, where there's no separation between sage and the mountain. So we as a body and mind become the mountain and mountain becomes us, ind independently arise and then also cease to arise. When we become intimate, intimate with something, it is no longer, uh, it no longer exists and we, no longer exist. There's no way to talk about it, to judge it or analyze it or categorize it. It fills a whole universe. And as the Master Dogen says, quote, to hear sounds with the whole body and mind, to see forms with the whole body and mind, one understands them intimately, end quote. So this is a place where I want to pause and talk about this important concept called uh, dependent origination in Sanskrit is called Pratitya Samupada. And in uh, the book Rahula, Rahula, what the Buddha taught, uh, Dr. Rahula says, condition genesis. That's okay. Uh, but dependent origination is a classical kind of English, uh, you know, um, terminology for uh, that. Um, and also, uh, so this notion of Pratitya Samuppada was actually um, expounded by this wonderful and venerable um, monk from India in second century CE called Nargarjuna. Nargarjuna was the founder of the Madhyamaka school of Buddhism. Madhyamaka is just a word for the middle way school. And middle way is also an important kind of um, image for Buddhist teachings and the life. So Nagarjuna says, all beings consist of causes and effects in which there's no sentient being at all. From phenomena which are exclusively empty, there arise only empty phenomena. All things are devoid of any I or mind. These are very profound teachings, so you're going to have to um, let that sink in a little bit. Um, but the word empty again is shunyata. And it just means that we don't ex exist by ourselves. We are, ex we arise according to, you know, with others 
dependently. Uh, and let me illustrate that. And, and by the way, I just want to say that this teaching is also found in the two important Mahayana East Asian sutras or the sacred text, the Diamond Sutra and the Avatamsaka Sutra, which we'll look at a little bit later. And it's, it's a core teaching that's embedded in the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and basically, it's just saying that the Dharma, or the teachings of the Buddha, are dependent. And I keep saying that, but we just have to understand that, that inter interdependent uh, relationship. For example, a flower is not just a flower. Uh, this was once illustrated by the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a Vietnamese